Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Actually, let's open to chapter 9, because we have a few verses yet to cover in that chapter. We ended last week in verse 11 and 12. <clears throat> Just a quick review. Remember, in Ecclesiastes 1 through 6, Solomon is dealing with the question, what good is there uh, all, to all man's labor under the sun? What profit is there? And he uses those six chapters to explain that there is none under the sun. Ecclesiastes 7, he changes his tone a bit and starts looking at things that are better under the sun. Since nothing is, is eternally uh, significant under the sun, it's all vanity. He says, well, what is better? And he determines in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 11, that wisdom is good. And so he says wisdom is good, and yet in Ecclesiastes 8, 9, and we'll see 10 and 11 here, he's uh, determining things that hinder this wisdom. Okay, and so um, living in this vain world, in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, he dealt with how to live with injustice, how to live with sin. Even though we know wisdom is good, uh, none of us are wise in ourselves, so we have to seek that out. So living with sin, uh, living with death, in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and how to deal with that. And uh, chance, time and chance, where we left it last week, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11 and 12. Remember, the, the race is not to the swift, battle is not to the strong, the bread is not to the wise, nor riches to the men of understanding. This is all contrary to what Proverbs would say and what we would think naturally would be the consequence of walking in wisdom. And Solomon here reminds us that wisdom, though valuable, is vulnerable and, and may not work all the time under the sun because... Time and chance happens to everybody. And so, uh, even though he says wisdom is better and wisdom is good, it doesn't always work out. So how's that for a guarantee <laughs> under the sun? You don't really have one under the sun. Ecclesiastes uh, 9, verse 12 then. Man also knows not his time, as the fishes that were taken in an evil net, as the birds that are caught in a snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. And so Paul tells us to redeem the time because the days are evil. Uh, because we don't know when time and chance will happen to us, is, is Paul's implication there. And since we do have a mission and a, and a, and a purpose from the Lord, we ought to get busy doing that. Uh, Solomon, not having that mission, simply says we live in an evil time and, and time and chance happens. You don't know when it's going to happen, so you should walk in wisdom. But you don't know. It could, you could, your life could stop short. So, yeah, be prepared is the wise response. So in verses 13 through 18, he gives an example of wisdom's vulnerability or Rather, the contrast between its strength and its weakness. Uh, because we'll see here that he actually proves how wisdom is better than physical strength and wisdom is better than weapons of war. But in the same account, he gives how wisdom can be foiled by fools or folly. And so that's really going to be the theme of tonight's passage in chapter 10 is fools. How do we live with fools? And, of course, we all don't think we are the fool. It's always the other people on this planet that are fools. But Solomon realizes that folly and fools are, is the predominant uh, uh, environment in which we live. And so how do we live with that, uh, according to, to his wisdom here under the sun? So let's get into it. Verse 13. He says, This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. There was a little city and few men within it, and there came a great king against it and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. So this little city is going to be destroyed. There's no way around it. They're outnumbered, outmatched. In verse 15, there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. By his wisdom delivered the city. Negotiations, diplomatic talks, whatever happened in his wisdom, he delivered it. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. And so this is, apparently Solomon saw this uh, thousands of years ago in his travels or conversations with great kings and rulers uh, across the world or in his own experience. Uh, there's a couple of cases in the Bible that somewhat match it, um, but this also happens throughout history. You can read about it in history books where there have been men, unnamed men, who have uh, changed the course of battles, wars, uh, history, uh, that you just, you just don't know their name. They're forgotten. And uh, this is what Solomon says, that it's, it's a great, it shows a great power and wisdom, but it's also kind of a vanity thing because no one remembers them. In verse 16, Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Now, in Proverbs chapter 1, if you just turn there for a moment, we're going to get a definition of what a fool is. And this is what Solomon's talking about, about this wise man in the city who delivered them, but no one remembered his name, and his wisdom was despised, even though his wisdom saved them. 
in Proverbs chapter 1. Now, Proverbs is a book written to Solomon's son to give him wisdom and instruction, right? Uh, and so that's what Proverbs is about. And Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, for sake, for sake not the law of thy mother. So you see the definition of fools in verse 7? Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's what a fool is. Okay, A fool is someone who, who is being instructed and refuses it. Right? Who doesn't care about what is wise, doesn't care about what is better, doesn't care about what will gain them a better profit, isn't concerned even with the questions of Ecclesiastes. They're going to go whatever their heart desires, whatever way they want, whether it's their weak position or, or, or a lesser position or an unprofitable position, they don't care. They're going to make those choices. And so in Ecclesiastes 9... It says, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor doesn't, the, the, the fools in this city don't care. The poor man's wisdom is despised by these fools, and his words are not heard by these fools. So here's one poor wise man delivered the city, and he's in a city of fools. Right? This is the theme. How do you live with wisdom among fools? You drive yourself crazy. What do you do? And in verse uh, 17, it says, the words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that rules among fools. Uh, what you'll see in the next chapter is a collection of what it seems like Proverbs. And a lot of them very closely resemble the Proverbs Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs. Okay? And the reason why this is, is, is he's trying to explain here how you can identify fools so that you can avoid being them. The, the only way you can live in this world of fools is not only to have wisdom, but to not be one. Don't make yourself part of the problem, essentially, is what Solomon says, right? And under the sun, that's about the best wisdom you can get under the sun. Uh, he's not talking about salvation. He's not talking about Christianity or Christ. He's simply talking about living in a world of fools. Don't join the party. You know? um, be, be the wise man here that even though he's despised and no one hears him, um, having the wisdom is better than not. Right? Being able to use it in, in those, can those cases, even if you're not uh, given uh, thank uh, thanksgiving for your use of it. So... It says in verse uh, 17, the words of the wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. The poor wise man, of course, was not the ruler of the city, and yet he saved the city. The fool was the ruler of the city. And even though the wise men saved it, probably the fool took credit, right? And the fool said that wise man didn't know what he's talking about. It was all my idea. He saved the city, and then he cries among these fools what his agenda is, which is contrary to wisdom, and everyone loves him because he's the king and saved the city. So this is how it works in the real world, right? Uh, most often is that the last word is not really heard by those that speak truth or that deserve it or that earn it. In the world, typically, um, fools because of their, uh, how do you say it, their loudness, which is what it says here in verse 17, more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. You can identify a fool, and we'll cover this a little bit more later, um, by their being loud and repetitious, their bold and even what they say to be sincere cry. They think that's what truth is. How do you know what truth is? Well, does the majority say so? It must be true. Right? Do you say it frequently? It must be true. Right? Are you saying it with boldness? It must be true. Are you saying it louder than the other guy? It must be true. These are all foolish conclusions, but this is what the fool thinks. The fool thinks, well, he can't be true. No one else agrees with him. He can't be true. Who said that before? He can't be true because he can't speak loud enough, influence enough people. He doesn't have a platform. He must not be true. Must not be wise, right? So um, it's interesting here to see how fools react and how sometimes we fall into that category, and many times the world falls into it. Interesting thing about this chapter, chapter 10, is that in the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about vanity and, and, and folly and that sort of thing, but a third of the time the word folly or fool shows up is in this chapter right here. So it is a theme that, that runs throughout even if it is just a collection of, of Proverbs. Okay. Verse 18 says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war. That's a bold statement. But it, it's true as well, in that if you can, through wisdom, work yourself out of a political dilemma, right? it's much better than going to war and having people die over it. Right? So you have that idea that wisdom is better than weapons. Sometimes you can negotiate a, a better result than pull out the gun. Right? Sometimes that happens, sometimes you can't. But the words of wise men are heard, uh, or, or is, the words are, wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one sinner destroys much good. So this is the, the foible of uh, folly, is that wisdom is so great, wisdom is so good, and yet one sinner, one fool, can ruin, ruin it all. Okay? Um, we see that in our own lives as well. 
you, you can, like North Korea, well, that, that's an example, one of many, right, how one fool can ruin, ruin it all. Um, it takes a lot of work to learn to be wise, either in the world or through God's wisdom. It takes effort to learn wisdom. You're not born with it, okay? Solomon wasn't born with it. It doesn't take any effort to be a fool. And it's that ease of effort that sometimes people take as a badge of pride. Look how easily I have become what I've become. And you look at a fool saying this and saying, that's foolish what you're doing. It's foolish. And they don't know any different. The problem with arguing with a fool sometimes is that they don't know that they're foolish. Right? Uh, 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 a, a modern word that we use that is not in the Bible for a fool is stupid. That's what the original Greek says. <coughs> no? That was a joke. Uh, fool is stupid. Uh, the problem with, with talking to a stupid person or someone who, who's uh, mentally deficient, and I'm not talking here about genetically, I'm just talking about willingly, um, you know, they don't have understanding, they don't have instruction, is that they don't know what they don't know. Right? And so they will boldly cry out what they think is true, and you're saying, this is not wise, this is not right, this is not true, and they just will not listen to you. They'll, they'll, they'll speak over you. Okay? They'll deny you. And they'll gather a posse and mob of people against you, and they're doing it all in foolishness. Right? And this is the world. And so, um, it says one sinner uh, destroys much good. Uh, we, we can think about Romans 5, verse 12, where in Genesis 1, God created the world and said it's very good. And one man, sin entered, and death by sin. Whoops. Right? Uh, so, we, we thank God thinking about that for Romans 5, verse 15 where Paul explains that by one man sin and death by sin, but by one man, Jesus Christ, all can be made righteous through faith in him. So um, God has the solution that by one man, by one sinner, much good is destroyed. By one man, much good is given in Jesus Christ. Okay, so you see just the one side of the coin here. Chapter 10 there then goes on for the next 20 verses dealing with how to identify these fools, uh, great evils concerning fools, foolish actions, foolish talking, and advice to you uh, to not join them in their folly. Okay? And that is the wisdom Solomon gives through here. We've already covered Proverbs 1, verse 7, where Solomon defined what a fool was. He despised wisdom and, and understanding. Proverbs 26, 4 tells you how to answer one. If you want to find a contradiction in your Bible, or an apparent contradiction, you'll find it in Proverbs 26, 4 and 5, right next to each other. By the way, it's these sorts of contradictions that fools point out. And they say, look at this, the Bible has mistakes in it. As if God couldn't remember the sentence he just spoke earlier. Proverbs 26, 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. What do you do? Do you answer a fool according to his folly or don't answer a fool according to his folly? What do you do? Well, apparently God's a bubbling fool and he doesn't know what he's saying. He's contradicting himself in every, every verse. Of course, you know the context tells you exactly how to answer a fool. In verse 4, don't answer him according to his folly. That means the way he answers you, right? The way he's speaking, the way he's acting. Don't act, don't be like the fool. This is what Solomon's going to say in Ecclesiastes 10. Don't be like the fool, right? Lest thou be like unto him. So the goal is don't answer him like the way he lives, answers, thinks, right? So the fool denies there's a God in Psalm 14. The fool seeks after immoral, wicked practices. The fool doesn't have understanding and despises wisdom. Don't answer him that way. Don't say, I'm going to set aside my faith in the Bible to answer you. Because you don't have faith, so I'll answer you like I don't have faith. That is folly. And you're becoming a fool, answering a fool, and that's ridiculous. Don't lower yourself to that level to answer a fool. In Proverbs 26, verse 5, answer a fool according to his folly lest he be wise in his own conceit. You see, when you make yourself like him, he's just going to scream over you and and deny you, and and you're going to answer him the same way, and you're never going to get anywhere. This is what happens in politics all the time. Okay? So, when George Bush was in office, right, the deficit was his problem. Barack Obama gets elected, the Democrats blame the Republicans for the deficit, right? Barack Obama gets out of office, Donald Trump comes in, what do Republicans do? Blame Barack Obama for the deficit. Right? And it goes on and on. What is this doing? One team becomes like the other team and they go back and forth. Right? It's like two little kids answering each other saying, oh, you fell down. Ha ha, you're foolish. And the yellow one falls down. He laughs back at him. Ha ha, you fell down. You're foolish. 
there's no wisdom here. It's folly following folly. And, and it, it's not answering any sort of wisdom back and forth. Okay. Truth doesn't matter the circumstance. Truth is truth. Facts are facts. Wisdom is wisdom. Okay. What you do is you answer according to wisdom. So Proverbs 26 verse 5 says, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Don't let a fool think he's wise. And this is very easy to do if you are wise. Right? And so when a fool comes to you and says the Bible has mistakes, and they say, no, it doesn't. God wrote it. Right? At which point they go away laughing at you. But their own folly is to deny the God that creates them. Right? Deny the morality that, that exists, that we all know about. The absolute truth is just folly. Okay? So there's more examples we can go into talking about that. But this is how Solomon's going to do here. He's not going to let the fool get away with his foolish choices. He's going to condemn them in this chapter. And then he's also going to, um, he's going to explain to you what wisdom looks like in response to it. Hebrews 10, or Ecclesiastes 10, rather, verse 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. <clears throat> the temptation among those... <clears throat> who is in reputation for wisdom and honor, is to say a little bit of foolishness doesn't hurt anybody. Right? And Solomon says, no, it does. Foolishness is never good. It's never right. Uh, you say, well, sometimes we need to forget, you know, cast all care to the wind and forget about what's wise and right and good. And Solomon says, no, that's never right. Because here is one fly in the ointment and it sends forth a stinking savor. The ointment was nice. It was smelled good. And suddenly, not so good. This is most prominent, of course, among those religious folks or religious uh, uh, people that are put on pedestals in our culture, whom when they commit a sin, when they're caught in their foolishness, when they're caught in their uh, ignorance or mistakes, wow, does our culture blame them for their hypocrisy, right? And look at them and say, wow, you, the, the whole church is filled with hypocrites and you all stink, right? And I think it's so ironic and Christians always cower and try to justify and hide behind, uh, you know, and, and put them under the rug and this sort of thing. And uh, the Christian response to when the culture looks at a Christian leader and says, look, they sin, you guys are hypocrites. So look them back in the eye and say, you guys sin every day. You're the hypocrites for calling us hypocrites. That's how you answer a fool so that they don't think they're wise in their conceits. They're puffing themselves up, pushing you down. You say, look, you guys, you sin all the time. You're the sinners. This guy sins once in public and you castigate him. Sin is wrong there. Sin is wrong there every time you commit sin. So Mike Pence, what is he? He says, you won't eat dinner with another woman? Right? Wow, was he hanging for that? Mm -hmm. On digital social media, right? And yet, was it Bill Clinton having adulteries? JFK having adulteries left and right? right? Almost every president before the modern media has had open adultery during their terms. But Mike Pence won't have dinner with another woman. Now, this is horrible. Right? Don't answer a fool according to their folly. Don't be like them. Right? Point out how they're being foolish in the way they talk and the way they respond to these things. They're being ignorant of truth. Okay? The way they live their lives, if our leaders live their lives according to the way they live their lives, then there'd be a lot more news to write about. That's for sure. Right? Let's see, that's the issue. That's the hypocrisy. We don't like going to church where they're all stiff-shirted and, and you know, wearing ties and that sort of thing. And then they turn on the television and they're rooting for people wearing ties and suits. What, what is that all about? And they get into a military and they're wearing suits and ties. What is that all about? That's hypocrisy, you see. And so Solomon says, call it out. And this is what he's saying in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 1. He says, so doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. So if, if you are in reputation for that, if you're seeking wisdom and honor, don't... Don't even justify folly, foolishness. It, it, does, it has no place uh, in you. I point your outline, it's easier to make a stink than to keep it sweet. And this is true. The commentator said that. It's easier to make things, to mess things up, destroy things, and to build them up, and to keep them straight. Chapter 10, verse 2, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. What does this even mean? Any left-handed people in here? I'm good, I won't fit anybody here in a moment. <laughs> The Bible talks about the right hand as um, a place of strength, okay, a place of righteousness. In fact, it's interesting to study the history of this. And people talk about why is there right-handedness versus left-handedness. One of the things science can't explain, by the way. We don't really understand 
why this is the case. But there, the majority of people are right-handed. A minority of people are left-handed. Okay? And the, the etymology of that right and left actually comes from the idea that the right hand was the right way. Does that make sense? That's why it's right. What's the opposite of right? Wrong. <laughs> no, left. Right? And so et- etymologically, that's where it came from, the, the, the origin of the words. There was the right, and then there was not the right. There was the wrong. There was the left. And to go left is not going right, walking upright, walking forward. Instead, you're walking froward. You're walking different. You're walking on the weak side, right? Your sword is in your right hand. You're my right-hand man. You see, this is the side of strength. And this is the way the Bible uses it over and over again. He's sitting on God's right hand. You know, he uses that phrase over and over again. So here, a wise man's heart is at his right hand. A wise man desires, is what it's saying here, to walk in the right and to do right. Okay? A fool, in contrary, has his heart at his left, which is simply saying he desires weakness. See, a wise man desires strength and righteousness and honor and the right way and the straight way. And the, the fool says, I don't care. I desire a weak. I don't care if it's better for me or not. I don't care if it, 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 it improves things or not. I desire what I desire. You see, that's what verse 2, ten, two is talking about. This is how you identify a fool. By if they're following their heart's desire. Psalm 10 verse 2 says that the wicked boast of their heart's desire. This is what Psalm 10 verse 2 says. Verse 3 says, Yea, also, when he that is a fool... By the way, a wise man understands something about his heart. That it's desperately wicked. And that his heart doesn't know what is right. You're born with heart's desires. Heart's desires are, are bred in you naturally and by a result of your environment. It is not a consequence of wisdom. Ever. You want to know the secret to living a, a successful life, spiritually speaking, the way Solomon's speaking, is to walk in wisdom. That's what he says in the book of Proverbs. Right. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 3. Yea, also, when he that is a fool walks by the way, his wisdom fails him, and he saith to everyone that he is a fool. This is interesting here. So he says, um, since he doesn't desire to walk right, he's not going to walk right. And you can tell a fool not only by his heart's desire, uh, but by the way he walks. Okay? Here in verse 3, when a fool walks by the way, his wisdom fails. And so while he's walking, he, there's a failure in his choices. But instead of looking at his choice and saying, well, that was a mistake, that was a foolish thing, I'm going to correct that. Remember, the fool doesn't care about that. The fool actually is puffed up in pursuing the desires of his heart. He's going to justify the choice and say, you all are fools for not doing what I'm doing. Which, which makes sense. That's what fools do, right? They make foolish choices. They fall on their face. You say, well, maybe you ought to learn from this. And they say, no, I'm not learning anything. You guys are foolish not following what I'm doing. And you're going, that's a fool. <laughs> that is a fool. That's what the biblical definition of it is. And so in verse 4, the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee. Leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. This sounds very much like a proverb in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath. That's, that's the wise man's response to when the ruler rises up against you. A fool's response is to do one or two things. Because they pursue the desires of their heart, because they're weak. Remember the left hand, the, the idea there, the analogy. Because they're weak. And this is, by the way, prevalent in our culture today. It's amazing how few, there's, there's less and less people who will actually stand by what they did and what they said, whether it be right or wrong. They won't admit their mistake, right? They won't stand upon what they did right. Instead, they'll run away. They'll hide their face, right? Or they'll react so rashly and try to justify their error that they're going to cause anger and argumentation. Right. See, they're so proud or they'll just cowardly run away. This is, this is how the fool responds to when they say before a ruler who's against them. Right. The wise man, of course, takes a stand knowing that the choices he made were his choices. He's going to take whatever is a result of that. I'll deal with the consequences. If they're wrong, then it's wrong. If it's right, it's right. And a soft answer turns away wrath. Oftentimes, wisdom, when you are caught doing wrong or someone's against you, is simply to articulate with a soft response why you did what you did, whether it's right or wrong, and leave it at that. Right? And this is what Solomon says in Proverbs. This is what he says here in verse 10, chapter 10 about how you can identify a fool. Right? Solomon no doubt saw a lot of those folks where when they had to meet their day before him, they fled in cowardice or tried to fight him, which wouldn't work anyway. Remember back in chapter, uh, chapter uh, I think it was 8, we, we dealt with that. So, 
Ways you can identify a fool. You can know them by their fruit. That's the smell in verse 1, right? Jesus also taught that. You can know them by their desires. That's their heart. Their walk. That's the way that they do things. And their words or reaction. And we'll get into words more a little bit later. The way they respond in conversation. Okay? In the court. So, we're seeing here Solomon identifying what fools are. In verse 6, or 5 rather, we're going to continue on here. It says, there's an evil which I have seen out of the sun as an error which proceeds from the ruler. So we've been talking about the fools in town and just everywhere else. Here, the rulers uh, have a folly that they fall in. Folly is set in great dignity. This is the error, is when rulers take what's foolish and what's folly and make that honorable, put it in a place of dignity. I can't think much of a greater example than the, the annual roast that occurs in the White House Correspondents' Dinner. It, it's a comedian's thing. In fact, Donald Trump didn't attend it this year at all, right, for various past reasons, if you've seen the past Correspondents' Dinner. But it's a comedian show. It's a comedy show is what it is. A roast on the president and politicians in general. Okay. But it's black tie. Dignified, right? And what's dignified? Comedians. Making fun of the institution that's supposed to operate the greatest nation on the planet. Comedians. This, this represents America. In fact, the last few elections, some of the, the greatest influencers, uh, influential people uh, in the election, uh, as far as influencing people and who to vote for, have been comedians. Okay? And so you have the, 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 the Daily Show and things like this, making statements and being, uh, and having an effect on things on both sides of the aisle. And, it, and I've said this before, when you have the speakers of truth, the church, disappear. They're replaced by what? Scholars, right, who deny the existence of God. Comedians who try to mock religion and things like this. Fools replace them. And, and so instead, Christians try to be like them and create our own comedians. We've got our own Christian comedians, our own Christian scholars. Why don't you just preach truth and then you'll sow the folly for what it is? Folly, you say. But the great error is when leaders allow this to happen. Because the truth is a leader leads and a, lead has, a leader has a pattern that he influences others who follow in our country and elsewhere. And so a leader ought to say, that's foolishness. This is righteousness. This is truth. This is wisdom. When was the last time we've had a wise ruler? I don't know. <laughs> you see, Proverbs talks about that. When, we, when people have a wise ruler, the people rejoice, right? And uh, it's been a while, it seems like, since we've been able to rejoice. Uh, Solomon, of course, realizes that uh, in his own rulership, he had a lot of folly that he performed. In his own royalty, remember what he did? He pursued the affections of his flesh for quite a while. Hmm. That seems like foolishness. And he admits it. It was. I pursued folly, he said, in madness. That was a mistake. He realizes this in Ecclesiastes 10 here while he's journaling his, his, his uh, life. But he says, folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in a low place. Okay. Now, the rich here, according to Proverbs and according to the Old Testament, it, the way Proverbs talks about being rich, how do you get rich according to Proverbs? You, you work. You do right. You walk in wisdom. Proverbs says, walk in wisdom and you'll be successful. Walk in wisdom and you'll have things. Proverbs gives you the godly admonition, according to the law also in the Proverbs, that if they did right, they would be blessed. That's what Proverbs teaches. And so it's not here that these rich people are the bad guys. These are the people who are doing right. These are the wise people, right? Those who did not have were the fools in Proverbs. Proverbs, those were the lazy, the fools, they did not have. Now, the difference between Proverbs and this dispensation is that we don't live under the covenant relationship with God where he promises and guarantees blessing for doing good. We live under grace. It's not according to your works. And so, living in a present evil world, quite often, we see Solomon's result happen where, where those that do good may not even be wealthy. Right? And so, we've covered that before. But here, Solomon says, because of this, this, uh, this pattern of elevating foolishness and folly and dignity... He's seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the, rich, uh, upon the earth. The rich sit in a low place. The fools sit in a high place. Okay. And what do the fools say because they're sitting in a high place? Why are they right? Because I have the high place. Right? Does their status make them right? No. Does their wealth make them right? No. You see, but this is what the, the argument of fools is. 
And Solomon's seen this. I've seen servants upon horses, princes walking as servants upon the earth. Verse 7 there uh, gives us somewhat of an illusion. Uh, maybe Solomon didn't know what he was writing, but it, it speaks about Jesus as well. Jesus was a prince, king of kings, prince of uh, peace, right? Walking as a servant upon the earth. So the same vanity, the same humility, the same backwardness where you see Jesus when he incarnated as God, the king of kings, incarnated, was walking as a servant in humility. Okay, so he, he, Jesus came into this vanity, evil life, and that's what we can read knowing what we know uh, uh, spiritually about this verse here. Okay. That's right. Yeah, he, he made himself in the form of a servant, as Philippians 2 says. And so, um, talking about incarnation, just as a, in a brief moment here, um, make sure you remember that, that his humility, his being made of a low reputation, which is what Philippians 2 says, had nothing to do with him not being God. He was still God. Just like here, this, this, uh, this rich man was still rich, and this prince was still a prince, right? But he was walking as a servant. Okay, what, what the humility of Jesus was in his incarnation was not that he gave up his deity. His humility was that he was walking on this earth, and God doesn't deserve that. You say, just, just being here, having a visage of a man made of dirt, God doesn't deserve that. He's more glorious than that, right? That was his humility, and just living in this life. And when he lived in this life, he obeyed rulers in this world. God doesn't deserve that, Right? But remember, he, he stood before Pilate, and he didn't cast judgment on Pilate. He stood before rulers, and he obeyed them. He said, give taxes to that guy, and he gave taxes to Caesar and everything. Why did he do that? Because he's walking as a servant. Right, so another topic we can talk about if you have questions, but something that uh, many Christians are, are, uh, are either forgetting or, or ignorant about these days is the incarnation and why and how Christ humbled himself. Okay, he had every attribute of deity. He simply was walking as a servant upon the earth. Verse 8 <clears throat> says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Now, ver verses 8, 9, 10, and 11 is talking about foolish actions. So, identify the fool in the first four verses. Okay, He's seen this great evil <clears throat> of fools being elevated and the wise being diminished by rulers. And so, that was kind of a warning to that. Um, and also a warning to those people to, to, to say that you can't look at someone's position to see whether they're a fool or not. Uh, fools can be high or low in the, in the hierarchy of society. <clears throat> but verses 8, 9, 10, 11 talk about foolish actions. Things that fools do um, that you could just flip around and, and not do them and you wouldn't be one. In verse 8, he that digs a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaks a hedge and serpent shall bite him. What is that saying? Don't dig pits, right? <laughs> Don't fall into the pits you dig? What is it saying here? He says in verse 9, whoso removes stone shall be hurt therewith. He that cleaves wood shall be endangered thereby. If the iron be blunt, he do not wet the edge. Then must he put to more. Uh, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and the babbler is no better. These four verses here are Solomon making fun of fools. Remember before I was talking about answering a fool lest he think he wise in his own conceits, right? Mm -hmm. This is Solomon doing just that. He's going. Fools, when they do these things, this is what happens because they're fools. They're idiots. They're stupid. Right? This is Solomon making fun of the foolish activities. Because each one of these things, you can see the fool justifying what they're doing and saying, I think I'm doing it right. Okay? In verse 8, he that digs a pit shall fall into it. Um, of course, people dig pits all the time and they don't fall into them. Why is this guy falling into the pit? Right? Well, because he's a fool. Right? Uh, they They... They build the very gallows upon which they are hung. And I say that in reference to the book of Esther. In the book of Esther. Mordecai and Haman. Haman the Persian wanted to hang Mordecai. He built the gallows to hang Mordecai. And then when Esther became queen, what happened? He was hung in the very gallows that he built for Mordecai. The, the devices, the malice, the, the plots, the strategies, the, the, the evil they intend to do to others. And they set these mechanisms in place. Solomon says, it come back to bite you is what happened. When you devise to do hurt and injury to others, it comes back to hurt you is what he's saying because you're a fool. If you were wise, you wouldn't be doing that. Right? And so a, a fool does something like that. He digs a pit for someone else and he falls into it. All right? So the book of Esther was talking about. Look at Psalm 7. Can we get some Psalm readers here? Get 
fun. But can we do Psalm chapter 7, verse 14 to 16? Jim, can you do Psalm 9? Yeah. And uh, go on Psalm 35. One of the day, let's see. Psalm 35, 6 3. So Psalm 7, 14. What's it say? Did you say 14 through 16? Yes, 14 through 16. Behold, he surveyed with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged er, and digged it and is fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealings shall come down upon his own head in no case. Yep. So here you have the same sentiment that David writes about. And here's a fool, the guys that are against him, that they are conceiving mischief, digging the pit, and falling to their own ditch, because their mischief returns upon their own head. And why? Because God made it so. So again, this is a covenant principle here. Okay. God may not you know, put fiery stones on the heads of your enemies today under grace. Uh, in verse 17, what's interesting in this chapter, Psalm 7, 17 says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Now, that sounds like a good, a good Christian song, right? But it's right after him saying, look what happened to that fool, right? He was trying to dig a pit. He fell into it because he, he got what he was reaping, you know, and praise the Lord. <laughs> That's what David's saying. So it's interesting, the context. Look at Psalm chapter 9 in verse 15. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made in the net which they hid is their own foot taken. So you see the same idea, and he says the same thing in, verse, in chapter 9 about praising the Lord, and the Lord is his, his judge. Uh, Psalm 35, 6 through 8. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause have they hid for me their net in a pit, which without cause they have dug, dig for my soul. Let destruction come upon him at, at unawares, and let his net and that he hath hid, catch himself into that very destruction, let him fall. And verse 9, let my soul shall be joyful in the Lord, shall rejoice in his salvation. <laughs> psalm 35 is what you call an imprecatory psalm. Imprecatory means a, a psalm of singing or a prayer of wishing evil upon your enemies. People say, oh, we're, we're Christians, we don't deal with doctrine or sin, we just deal with psalms. Well, have you read the psalms where David prayed for evil on his enemies? It's this type of thing. He says people are opposing me and God. That means they're opposing you and they're, they're opposing righteousness. And he prays and then he sees it happen and he sings praises for that it happened. It doesn't seem like a very Christian thing to do. Well, he's under the law, number one. And the law says if you do good, you get blessed. If you do bad, you get cursed. And David wants to see that happen. That's why in Psalm 119, he says, I love your law. Right? I want to see righteousness. And by the way, I do too. But I thank God for his grace. Because without grace, none of us will be delivered from his judgments. Right? David had mercy. Israel was his chosen people. There is no chosen people today. We're a bunch of sinners that deserve God's justice and, and wrath, and instead he gave us grace. And so uh, thank God for that. But in the context of Ecclesiastes and, and in Proverbs and Psalms, we see this idea of fools uh, walking into the very pit and the snare that they built for other people as a just retribution, a just reward. Okay. Um, look at Amos chapter 5, verse 18. It says, when you break down a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Hedges were like fences, right? And when you start breaking down these hedges, you'll, you'll see a snake there. You know how you, you prevent that, by the way? Um, you, you plan your work. You look ahead, right? You're not careless in your activity. You do right is how you prevent that. That's what Deuteronomy says. But Amos... Chapter 5, verse 18. Verse 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Who would desire such a day? This is what Amos is saying, right? Only fools desire the day of the Lord. There are people who pray for the Lord's day and the day of the Lord. Uh, the prophet here is making the point that these people are fools for doing so. There are people who would raise their fist at God. And say, God, you want to judge me? Have at it. Fool is what that is. Foolishness. Okay? And he says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? Right? We, I think I mentioned on Sunday how um, Sir Robert Anderson wrote in his book about the next thing prophetically God's going to do is cast judgment on the earth. And so Christians foolishly, meaning they don't have wisdom and understanding of what God is doing, 
They pray for God to intervene in this world, not knowing the next thing He's going to do is cast judgment. So they're what? They're praying for the day of the Lord to happen? Well, I mean, so either are, are wishing now not to preach grace to people that you've received for salvation, right? Or you don't know what God's doing and you think He's going to come back and help when actually He's going to come back and judge. Now, either way, there's some wrong understanding there about what God is doing. That's what foolishness looks like. But Amos here is writing and says, What end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness, not light. It's darkness, not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and then a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. What's it talking about here? You tried to flee from the lion and it's like if you fled and then you're safe from the lion, then a bear ate you up. And then you go to your house, try to hide, but while you're hiding, a serpent bites you in the house. So you can't, you can't escape it. The day of the Lord will bring judgment. There's no way around it. You see. And so this is what Amos is saying. And Ecclesiastes talks about the serpent biting you in the hand by digging up the hedge. Serpents in the Bible are, are, are constantly representative of this sort of uh, judgment. In Jeremiah chapter 5, there's a similar statement here, which is interesting, about serpents being a form of God's punishment. Or Jeremiah 8, excuse me. And maybe this will ring a bell for you if you've read Mark 16. Jeremiah 8, verse 17. God writes here, Behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. That's pretty clear. <laughs> Don't want to be there for that, right? Punishment. Serpents will bite them. Now, remember Mark 16? What God promised the signs and the powers to his believers uh, in Mark 16, the kingdom believers that would go through that tribulation? He said what? You can drink deadly things. You can pick up serpents and they wouldn't hurt you. Right? Why would he say such a random type of thing? Because prophecy spoke about it. Because he said, I will send as punishment serpents that will bite you. Right? And they can't be charmed. So you can't like get around that. They're going to bite you. Unless, Mark 16, you believe the gospel and you have the signs that follow them that believe, and suddenly you're protected from these serpents that bite. <coughs> the only way out of the tribulation for these folks is to be protected from it by believing the gospel. Right? By doing right, which is what the law says. Okay? And so faith and their works, right, protects them from that by the power that God gives them. But interesting statement there. In Acts 28, verse 4, remember when Paul was bitten by a snake? Remember what the response was from his companions there in Acts 28? Yeah, let's do something wrong. When, when the barbarians, and by the way, a barbarian is simply someone who didn't speak the language that they did. So it was a language issue, not a, necessarily a, a stupidity issue. But when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hanging off his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. It's the same idea. Though you flee from the lion, a bear is going to get you. You can't hide. You're going to get punishment. And he says, he's trying to escape through the boat. But God saw what he was doing. And now he's got this snake biting him. Right? Pretty smart barbarians. But the idea is they, 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 they're seeing the consequence. Uh, they're, they're presuming the consequence. Of course, what they did not know is uh, what many today still don't know, is the dispensation of grace given to Paul. Paul understood this snake's not biting me because, because God you know, hates me. He showed me grace, and he's preaching grace. And, he's, and plus, God told him that he would be safe through this journey and this sort of thing. So there was information that these barbarians did not know. But back in Ecclesiastes, we're back in that time where this is the case. So in Solomon making fun of these fools, saying surely the serpent will bite without enchantment and a babbler is no better. He's talking about this. Uh, this, this recompense for their foolish actions. Okay. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 9 says, Whoso removes stone shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaves wood shall be endangered thereby. I guess the lawyers here, um, who's available for being a lawyer? Do you want to read something? Deuteronomy 19? Deuteronomy 19, 14? Jim, could you get Deuteronomy 27, 17? Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy. We need some lawyers. Jeremy 19, 14, Jeremy 27, 17. In Ecclesiastes 10, verse 9, it says, Whoso removes stone shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaves wood shall be endangered thereby. Anybody ever done stone work or woodwork? Is this, is this a guarantee? Is this what it is? This is like you work with wood, you're going to get hurt? No, it's talking about fools. You're thinking about a fool. If a fool picks up that woodwork, you think he's going to get hurt. Right? If a fool does that, he's going to get hurt. Right? And so, a lot of times, when people... Um, they seem to be accident prone. Maybe it's because they're foolish. Maybe. 
And we've, anybody done accidents, done stupid things? Yes, we've all been foolish. It's a thing. But oftentimes, the things that you've reaped what you've sown. Either you were watching what you were doing, you were careless what you were doing, you were looking ahead, right? These sort of things. And because you didn't do that, you get hurt. So if you work with things like stones, work with things like wood and chopping big blocks, you know, remember when I was young, before I learned such things and walked in my folly, I, we were burning things out, out in, in our yard and the fire's burning there and you're throwing things in it. What you don't want to do is take something and throw it into the fire, right? Anybody know this by wisdom? I know it by experience. I learned that wisdom by experience, right? If you throw something in the fire, like a heavy thing, into the fire, things can jump back out at you. This is a problem. Right? This is what it's talking about. A fool gets hurt because they're fools. You see? And so this is what Solomon's mocking them over. Another thing to think about, about the removing of stones and the wood here, is that it's breaking the law. A fool will break the law and think they don't have consequences. A fool will cheat and steal and think they can get away with it. Right? And movies make people think it's true. They can't. They won't. Either in this life or, or before God. We covered that in chapter 8. Uh, the injustices that don't get rectified in this life, God is going to judge. You cannot get removed from your sin. Okay. This was the idea of the law. Deuteronomy 19, verse 14. What does it say? Thou shalt not remove thy labor's landmark, which they of old time have set in thine inheritance, which thou shalt inherit in the land that the Lord thy God gives thee to possess it. Possess it, yep. And so you have the landmarks marked by stones. You might have land out that is marked by stones before. You have stones in the corners of your, of your land, so the farmer or whatever it is. So you can, you can mark them. Even today, you know, when uh, surveyors go out to mark your land, they'll put a stake in the ground you know, to mark it where, your, where your land begins and ends. And, and uh, to move that, because, you know what? I want that tree or don't want that tree or whatever it is. Right? He's saying this is against the law. Deuteronomy 19. What's Deuteronomy 27 say? Cursed be he that... Re- he that removed his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say amen. Amen. All the people shall say amen. Cursed is he that moves the neighbor's landmark, because you're the neighbor, right? And we all say amen, right? Don't touch the landmark. Don't touch those stones. Leave them there. He that removes the stone shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaves wood shall be endangered thereby. The law talks about the law talks about keeping the stones there and talks about uh, uh, building things with wood in the temple, not tearing them down. But anyway, moving on to verse 10. If the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge. The word wet there simply means to make a sharp, right? That's how you, how you take an axe and you wet it uh, to make it sharp. Not with water, but to actually make it sharper. And he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. And so the phrase that comes to my mind, maybe yours too, is work smarter, not harder, Right? What's a fool do? A fool says, I'm going to save time and not sharpen that axe. And you know what happens? He's chopping for hours with a lot more energy instead of sharpening the thing and getting it done quicker. Right? This happens a lot in my kitchen. Sometimes I'm foolish, I have to admit. Because I got my tomato there and I get my knife. You know, taking the, the tomato cut doesn't get very good. You've got to sharpen the knife. Right? Just, I just mashed it. And I don't know why I don't sharpen the knife. I think it's saving me time. It's not. I'm ruining the tomato. You see, this is foolish behavior. See, now I'm falling. This is what it is. Don't follow my pattern, right? But this is, this is what Solomon is doing, making fun of this sort of foolish behavior. He says, wisdom is profitable to, to direct. So here, you see, wisdom will fix this. If you keep the law, if you think about how to walk in wisdom, then you're going to, to not reap some of these, these foolish uh, consequences. Verse 11, surely the serpent will bite without enchantment. We've covered the serpent already. And a babbler is no better. A babbler, someone who talks a lot, right? Here the fool is talking a lot. Just like a serpent will bite, a fool talking a lot will bite. In fact, Proverbs talks about this as well, okay? Um, was there a Proverbs talk about some of this stuff? We could talk about vain babbling for a, lot, a long time. A lot of the wisdom books deal with the words that you speak and the words that you say. Jesus says every idle word that comes out of your mouth will be judged. Uh, Proverbs deals with the words that people speak. And much words leads to sin, right? Um, It's going to be really hard not to make a mistake the more you talk. And uh, so here I am talking to you, telling you this, right? (laughs) Uh, Mistakes happen. Uh, One way to to seem to be wise, Proverbs says, is, is not to talk. And a fool just can't handle that. A fool thinks himself higher than he is and just must say something, must have the last word. And this is why back in the previous chapter, wise men really 
don't ever get the last laugh or the last word in this world, in this life, because a fool always comes back after and says something. And the wise man, because he's wise, goes, <laughs> and goes, oh, that's foolish. You know, I'm not going to respond to your folly. You know, because he's wanting to have the last word. If you catch yourself in that sort of cycle where you're both trying to get the last word, you're both fools. <laughs> that's answering a fool the wrong way. Yeah, just leave it alone. His, his much speaking is not adding anything to, to the wisdom that maybe you said. So uh, that's not the way to respond. This happens a lot on the Internet as well. You see fools everywhere on the Internet uh, where they've got to have the last word. Some post is on there to make a remark. The fool responds back, and you just can't help yourself. You respond back, then they respond back, and you respond back, and now you're in a foolish cycle. You know, just, just stop. Uh, if you said what you need to say, then stop. Okay, because Ecclesiastes 9 says, the words of a wise man are heard in quiet more than the cries of a fool. Right? And so when you speak truth, when word is, truth is spoken, people hear it. Okay? It only takes that one time to hear it. A fool thinks by much speaking he's going to be heard. Matthew 6 says this, right? He says, you think by vain repetition you're going to be heard by God? No, no, he heard you the first time. And when you speak the words of truth and someone's looking for truth and they hear that, they don't need to hear it 50 times. They heard it. It doesn't matter how much the fool speaks. If he's heard what you said and it's true, then they'll remember it. Even the fool remembers it. Okay, so you got that sort of uh, advantage when you have truth on your side, when you have wisdom on your side, which is why you should seek it out. More than rubies, more than gold and silver is what Solomon says in Proverbs. So you have that. Um, In verse 12, it says, the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. That's what we were just talking about. And Proverbs 10 deals with as well. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. Some people say, well, fools talking the way they do and, and, and saying silly things about what they don't know, what they're talking about, um, it's harmless. They're just babbling. You know, it's just idle talk. A lot of it is. But the problem is this, is that they begin with words that are just foolish, But then they end up being mischievous madness. I mean, they're causing problems now. See, the problem with fools and their much talking is not that their much words are so powerful against you. It's simply that they can do harm. It can end up doing damage, which is why you need to speak wisdom so that they don't think they're wise. Speak warnings so that others don't think they're wise. If you're just silent entirely and let fools talk, people are going to think, well, that must be the only option. Right? Give the other option. Rebuke the fool. Give the wisdom and let people make their choice. Right? Provide the alternative. Give the warning. Give the rebuke. Give the reproof. In order to prevent this sort of mischief in verse 13. But in in verse 12, it says, The wise man's mouth is gracious. The uh, the words of the wise man's mouth are gracious. This reminds me of Colossians 4, verse 6, where Paul says, Let the speech of your mouth be filled with grace. Right? And so uh, we speak grace doctrine. So quite literally, we're speaking God's grace. Um, Back in Ecclesiastes, the gracious words back there would be that soft answer, would be uh, that speaking with wisdom, not necessarily in order to win the argument or speak last. Colossians 4 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. That means you need some wisdom, right? The, the speaking with grace here does not mean in Colossians 4, 6, make sure you wear a smile and speak nice to everybody. That's not what it's saying. It says, let your speech be always with grace. It's doctrinal, right? Don't speak law because now you're becoming a fool. First Timothy chapter 1 talks about that. Speak with what God's truth is doing today. Seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So people have a response to truth, doc, true doctrine and wisdom in this dispensation. You ought to know how to answer every man with right doctrine. Titus 1, one of the qualifications there of a, of a deacon was that they may be able to exhort the gainsayers, right? to reprove and rebuke and, and exhort the gainsayers, those who are against. And so wisdom speaks up against those who are unwise and fools. It doesn't always mean calling them out as fools. The truth will do that by itself. And so that, that's, that's what you need to do. But the wise here in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 12, are, are filled with gracious words. The lips of a fool will swallow up himself uh, by attacking you, by attacking truth. It's going to be their own destruction. Okay? When, when people attack truth and they become malicious and they attack your person, don't do it in return. 
Right? This is a good, good principle when you're talking to folks. When people start getting angry and yelling, don't respond in anger and yelling. When people attack your person instead of the doctrine that you're trying to present them, don't take offense and don't attack their person because it's so easy to do. Right? Instead, deal with the doctrinal issue. Deal with the teaching of the truth. Right? And so don't, don't respond folly with folly. It says in verse uh, 14, A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be and what shall be after him. Who can tell him? Well, no one can tell a fool what's going to be because a fool thinks he knows what's going to be and he doesn't know what it's going to be. And so it's a dangerous thing. Words can give life or kill, according to Proverbs. Proverbs 10, verse 12 uh, says that uh, you can do a study on fools in the book of Proverbs. It's an amazing thing. Uh, there, there are quite a few verses in this book that identify and show you what is foolishness and what isn't. And Solomon is just repeating a lot of this stuff. Proverbs 10, verse 12. Hatred, uh, that's not the one I want. 10, 10, 19 through 21. Thank you. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. The tongue of the just is as choice silver, the heart of the wicked is little worth. You see, so uh, you speak five words of understanding. It's better than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, that's that's a, a proverb, right? Uh, you can throw down a, a couple silver coins and it could be worth more than a thousand pebbles, right? The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for one of wisdom. That's very practical. Uh, your words feed people. How's that? We say spiritually, yes, but also apparently materially, based on walking in wisdom. Remember the, the things in Ecclesiastes 10 that would follow a fool's actions. Well, why did they act that way? Because they first thought it, and then they talked about it, and then they did it. <laughs> right? That's how actions come about, based on what you think. So if you speak words that can change the way people think, from fools to wise people, it'll change their actions, and it'll change what happens as a result. Okay? And so fools die for want of wisdom. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he has no sorrow with it. And so um, it's a sport to a fool to do mischief. They think it's entertaining to do evil to other people. Um, Ecclesiastes 10, where are we at? Verse 14. We've already covered that. Verse 15, The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knows not how to go to the city. Uh, the fool's labor is spent in vain, you can say. The labor of the foolish wearies every one of them because of their wrong thoughts, because of their lack of understanding, lack of wisdom, not knowing the future, not knowing where they're going to go. Proverbs says a prudent man looks to his way and knows where he shall be, right? But not knowing that, he doesn't even know how to go to a city. Um, this is like saying, you know, you couldn't find, you know, home if it was a button on your smartphone. I don't know. It's, 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 it's the way of saying, a fool here doesn't know even know how to get back to town, is what he's saying back in his day, right? The labor of the foolish uh, weary every one of them. He's going to work and work and think he's doing something good, and it means nothing. I can't think of a better thing to describe a lot of the work in this world than that right there. It's a bunch of fools thinking they're doing something, and no, nope, they're not really accomplishing anything if they're doing much of all. And so uh, you have here the foolish, the foolish consequence. Now, verse 16 through the end, he gives this wise advice. Okay, How do you live with fools? How do you live in a world of fools? How do you uh, live when there's so much folly? Well, the answer, of course, is to understand that wisdom is valuable. Yes, it's vulnerable to fools that can mess it up and sinners that can destroy your work, but you still should walk in wisdom no matter what. You should seek wisdom. You should learn wisdom. Walk in wisdom. And in verse 16 through 18, he's talking about this. It says, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. Again, you see the natural consequence of reaping what you sow here and the land being affected, the, the nation, the people being affected by the ruler. Right, and what kind of ruler they are. In verse 16, it says, If their king is a child, and thy princes eat in the morning, then woe to you. See, what's this talking about? Well, Isaiah 3 and other places in the Scripture talk about this sort of punishment where God says, because of your disobedience, I'm going to send you children for rulers. Isaiah 3 says, Verse 4, I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them, and the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. Now, that's, old, that's King James language there, saying that the, the young child will not listen to the elders, 
and the poor and fools will work against the wise and the honorable. That's what he's saying the punishment will be. The punishment for Israel's disobedience was that children will lead them and they'll be proud over the elders who are supposed to have wisdom. By the way, what, what was going to happen in Solomon's future, which he knew about, by the way, because God told him, because of his disobedience, your kingdom's going to be split, right? And what happened when Rehoboam became king? He had a choice to make, remember? He said, how are you going to tax your citizens? And there was the wise men there, and they said, don't do what your dad did. He taxed us a bunch and built all that stuff over there. He says, you should really calm down a bit on this situation. And Rehoboam said, I'm going to be greater than my dad. I'm taxing you double, right? Listen to your elders, young man, right? And what happened? The kingdom was split. People hated Rehoboam, and all sorts of division happened, right? And so this is the sort of punishment that God prophesied on Isaiah 3 after Rehoboam, of course that would come upon Israel in the future. It says your children will lead you and you, you won't have wisdom and honor in those high places. You'll have them in low places. It'll be backwards. Your civilization will be backwards. It's what foolishness is. It's backwards. It's just, it's foolishness. It's folly. Okay? And so, <clears throat> when he says this in Ecclesiastes 10 about a child uh, being the king, <clears throat> he, he, he's bringing this up, even though we can think about the punishments God promised to Israel. Um, he's bringing it up because woes follow in this case. Woe unto you, right? And so if you're a wise man living in this land and you see this happening, right, what, do you, what should you expect, right? Well, I'm living in a foolish nation, a foolish time, an evil time. You're going to take prudent steps to protect yourself from the folly and the woe that will come as a result, right? As a wise man, that's what you ought to do. He's telling you here, here's how you know if woe and blessing will come upon you. Look at the leader. How is he behaving? How is he talking, right? How do you know a fool? Identify the fool. Look at him. Is he a fool or a wise man? Because it's going to start at the top. And if he's a fool, it's going to filter down. And you, if you're a wise man, should protect yourself from whatever's happening. If it's a fool, that's a leader, right? That's how you live with fools. Don't be one. Don't join them. Know how to walk in wisdom. Look ahead. Work hard. Provide for yourself, right? Speak evil of no man. Titus 3 says. The next verse says, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles. By the way, what's it mean that the princes eat in the morning? I mean, nowadays people say, eat a balanced breakfast, right? It's a, it's, you lose weight if you eat breakfast, apparently they say. And you lose weight if you don't eat breakfast. I don't know which one's true. but it, What's it mean to eat meals in the morning? Well, interesting study. If you'd like to study out how many meals we eat, uh, the history of how many meals we eat per day is an interesting type of read. Um, the, the three meals a day that we eat now... Um, what was it breakfast, lunch, and dinner? If you're from the north, and then breakfast, dinner, supper from the south. How was it in Virginia? Breakfast, dinner, supper, is that what it was? Yeah. Was it different? But it, they call them different names. But how many meals you ate during the day and when was a reflection of um, the class in society that you were in in some parts of the world in history. Okay? And, and the wealthier would eat at certain times, and the workers would eat at certain times. And, and they say the timing of our modern meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, came as a result of the American workday, you know, the, the general workday. So it was around the hours you would work. Work before you eat, or eat before you work. There's a break in the middle of your work, and then you eat afterward. But for a long time, the lower classes in America would have one meal a day. And guess what it would not be? It would not be in the morning. You wake up, eat this big meal, then what, you work 12 hours? Ain't doing that. You wake up, you work. You have this big meal to give you energy. You work some more, you go to sleep, and then you eat one big meal like that. That's how that, that used to be. Right? The idea here is simply being that if a prince is eating meal in the morning, what's he not planning to do? Work. <laughs> not planning to work. Right? He's, he's going to, whatever he desires, he wakes up, what do I want for breakfast? That's what I'm going to do today, whatever I want. Right? Well, he's going to eat this big breakfast, and then you know, that's what he's going to do the rest of the day. Verse 16, uh, or 17 rather, Blessed art thou, O land, when the king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season. So apparently you're going to look at how this guy eats. Now, I don't know what it means. President Trump eats Big Macs and, and, and Diet Coke. I don't know. That's, I don't know if it's in due season or out of season. I don't know. But he says, princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. And so if he's doing it for strength, I guess, that would be indicative of his willingness to work hard. But if you're eating and drinking as the, the king here, as the ruler, for the sake of your own pleasure and drunkenness. This is a sign to the wise in the land that lower blessing can happen. Right? You have to make that judgment. So, in verse 18, 
By much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house drops through. So how do you keep the house from dropping through? How do you keep the building from decaying? You need to maintain it. The wise know this, right? Look at the ant, Proverbs 6 says. He works in order to have for the winter, right? What did Jesus say when he came? Look at the raven. He doesn't work. Dispensational truth, right? We talked about this before. Jesus said, look at the raven. He's not working and God provides for him. But Proverbs says something different. Look at the ant. He works more than works to have for when those bad times come, right? Jesus, of course, was preaching and teaching during a time of a kingdom that Solomon was not operating under. Jesus was going to bring in the kingdom of God that would provide their food. Solomon's not providing their food back here, right? And God's not doing that either. So he says you have to work with your hands. Paul, by the way, says the same thing. Since God's not providing our daily bread today, uh, we, if we don't work, we don't eat. And our house will decay, meaning our family and our ha- physical house and that sort of thing, if we don't maintain it. And Paul says we're worse than an infidel if we deny that because we're denying wisdom, right? Denying the faith that God is operating today under. So verse 18, you need to work. Verse 19, a feast is made for laughter, a wine makes merry, but money answers all things. Which, wow, if you want a verse to support your money seeking, there, that is it right there. And uh, I don't know if you can say anything any more true again about the, the world under the sun um, without any affection on things for eternity. Money answers all things. You can get anything under the sun with money. Now, everybody knows there's things you can't buy with money. But if you can't buy them with money, then, you know, it's, it's not something that is significant according to the world under the sun. All right? But money answers all things. You want to have a better job, bribe someone with money, right? <laughs> uh, if you had more money, you wouldn't even need one. Um, pastors, when they make a choice of where God's called them to teach, right? well, they look for the benefit. How much money are you going to pay me? If you'll make choices based on this. Don't you choose that in your job? You, yes. people, Christians say that I'm going to pray for God's calling for my life, and they get offered two jobs. One gets paid so much money. One gets paid so much money plus a bonus. And they're going, I think God's calling me over here. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this isn't everyone's choices. Unless you're wise and, and, and spiritually minded, this is the way people make choices. They pursue the almighty buck. And so uh, money answers all things. Uh, you can feast and make laughter. You can wine and make merry. You can have money and you can provide, have it all. This is what he's saying here. So what's the advice to, to wise men here? Is that it does matter if you have money in order to have, to be protected. Remember money was a defense? The fool says don't care about it. Well, you're going to end up in poverty, you see. And so, the wisdom here. Curse not the king, verse 20. No, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in, the, in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. So people say, a little bird told me, right? People think that phrase comes from this verse. A little bird told me. Yeah, if, if you're going to curse the king or curse the rich, it's not going to be good for you no matter what. You're not winning any battle. You're just letting off steam. It's what fools do, much speaking, right? And you're going to bite someone, and they're going to bite you back. So the good wisdom is what? You're looking at the future, looking ahead, looking at your circumstances to see how you can walk in wisdom, prudence, you know, protecting yourself from that stuff. You're going to work hard with your hands. Okay? You're going to provide for yourself. You're not going to knock others down to get ahead. It doesn't matter if they're fools or not. You're just not going to do it. It's not wise. And this is practical wisdom Solomon gives for living in a world full of fools. You know, try to avoid their consequences. Right. It can be hard sometimes, and we all get affected by foolish decisions people make, and some of our own. But Solomon is trying here to give advice to, to help you live your life with joy. Remember in Ecclesiastes 9, the issue was to live your life and to enjoy it. And part of that's walking wisdom. All right, any comments, any, any thoughts? All right, Lord, we thank you for your wisdom that you graciously gave Solomon and that you inspired this book for us to learn about the realities of this world. I pray we would not forget about the things that are above the sun. We set our affections on those things so that uh, we can remember that this life is only temporary. And many of the things that uh, people pursue are not the things you'd have us do. And so we pray that you give us wisdom according to your word. We would increase in understanding in what you're doing so that we can walk uh, with joy and walk in wisdom uh, among those that are without. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Amen.